the environmental and ecological and the socio-cultural. And the, the question you ask, if you want sustainable development, and if you are thinking as part of a country, as a country as, that is part of the wider global system, and you're thinking about sustainable, a sustainable planet, because all countries contribute to that sustainability, is that possible without perpetual innovation? And the answer to that is no. And that is where the innovation driven, and the chairman mentioned that there is a distinction between innovation driven and driving innovation, becomes very important because sustainable development, especially if it involves self-sustainability in each instance and cooperatively as part of a sustainable development framework for self-sustainability and sustainability of the planet, that's to say the planet's ability to sustain itself is not possible without perpetual innovation. And that is what makes innovation so critical and makes it essential that it be put at the heart of the entire development process. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means in terms of each individual human being. But just a second, I will go on a little bit with the script that I have and the text that I have prepared. Now, improving and developing the physical and ICT infrastructure. The top innovating countries in the world have improved their ICT and physical supporting, infra <coughs> physical supporting structures towards creating an efficient, conducive environment for innovation. In terms of physical infrastructure, the focus is on removing necessary, unnecessary de delays by improving highways and mass transit systems. Many businesses have to make key business decisions quickly so programs that contribute to broadband expansion permit faster information sharing and decision making etc. that are desired. I need to tell you that we have a national ICT policy now which has been approved by cabinet. This is driven by the Ministry of Science and Technology. And the broadband issue is at the center of that process. And I think you know that major highways are being developed to develop the southwest side of the country the eastern side of the country from Valencia to Tuku and in the Digo Martin area, so in west, in east, and in south. And the, we have a growth pool in the north coast in which a recommendation has been made as to how we need to open that up. And I want to tell you that it has nothing to do with cutting a tunnel through the mountains. So, all right, other emerging trends. Since the late 1990s, high technology goods have been among the most dynamic components of international trade. As such, a country's ability to compete in high technology markets is therefore important to its overall competitiveness in the world economy. This is an important matter because you cannot Perhaps as I am speaking here, or maybe an hour from now, the chairman of the Council of Competitiveness, Mr. Richard Lewis, Francis Lewis here is the deputy chairman. Mr. Richard Lewis is presenting to a Waitro conference. Waitro, con the Waitro, Waitro is a, a world gathering of industrial research institutions involved in applied research institutions such as Kariri or its equivalent in other countries. And most of them in the world are focused on, on um, innovation. And Richard is basically presenting today and giving an update on 30 countries that had been addressed in Trinidad and Tobago, big, medium, and small, on innovation readiness. So they did that survey about a year ago and presented the results to us. And then they updated the survey by going back to the companies to find out what has happened. And Richard is going to present that today 
to that conference. So we have that kind of work going on. Because the issue here is not only innovation in the companies, as he will present, but whether or not we are making the technological leaps necessary to move us into another sphere of development. So the, if we are going into agricultural production as important for reducing the food import bill, for changing tastes, patterns in food consumption, and linking with the tourism industry, et cetera, but you are also doing that to reduce food inflation, and you're also doing that in order to increase the number of entrepreneurs in the food production sector. Do you do that in the traditional way? Or do you do that in a way that is driven by research, science, technology, technical competence of the highest order, an appreciation of the food chain and the value chain associated with that, and therefore the strategic interventions that is required. And those are some of the issues that, are, that we are actively engaging in right now. So a lot of the eye-to-eye -eye projects had to do with technological innovation and new interventions in the food production sector. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, what do we need to focus on, given what we know of what successful countries are doing? And the first thing that we need to do is to create an environment that is conducive to innovation, to create the conditions in which people are aware of innovation and the innovative process, and appreciate that there is a connection between an idea, market, and consumer acceptance, convenience, and appreciation, and therefore the growth of that market. And this is very important, and that's what we are trying to do now with the whole innovation framework that we are trying to develop. And I want to say the innovation policy is being developed as we speak. It started in 2013. It is going to be completed this year. It is funded by the IDB partially and partially by the European Union. And what we are finding as we do the work to prepare that policy is that in countries that are really successful, you need an innovation ecosystem. But when we look at Trinidad and Tobago, we find that uh, there are institutions that exist, there are a lot of disconnects, that one of the key things is to connect them in a much more coherent and meaningful and mutually supportive way but we are also finding that there are also a lot of gaps and deficiencies in the institutions that you need. So by marrying our knowledge about what we have and how they can work better, and by identifying what is missing and what we need to do to make up for the deficit, we are on the way to designing not just an innovation policy, but a national innovation system that can actually work. And that means an innovation ecosystem that is pretty well connected. The second ish thing that we need to do is higher levels of collaboration between industry and academia, both local and international. And I want to say a word about competitiveness. Yesterday, I was at the conference, the Waitro conference, and I spoke there. And the chairman of Waitro who is the head of the largest technological university in India. The, um, I forget what's the name of the institute, I think it's called the Gautam Bud University in Uttar Pradesh. Now I know that university, I've visited it. It consists of several campuses across the country with its base in Uttar Pradesh, and it has hundreds of thousands of students. In fact, I think it's over a million students that that university has, and it's a technological, in different campuses, not in the same place. It's uh, in different campuses all over. Um, and it's very technologically or oriented, very engineering oriented. And he was saying yesterday, 
that there are two important things that we need to understand about, first of all, the change in competitiveness. He says competitiveness today requires collaboration. He said there was a time when we thought of competitiveness as competition, but competitiveness today requires collaboration. And I think it is important to remember that. We say that our vision for this country is prosperity for all, and we say that we will achieve lasting prosperity through innovation. But we also say in the medium term framework, through creativity, collaboration, and innovation, we shall prosper together. And I want to underscore that because it's a very important thing, and this business of collaboration is very important. And the collaboration between industry and academia, uh, both local and international, is not as good as it should be. It is not as good as it should be. Yesterday, I had a conversation with the representative for one of the institutions in Nigeria. And what they are doing in Nigeria, what that institution that she has does, is that they identify in industry what are the problems and issues that they need to have solved and resolved? And what are the research areas that they need help in? They then go to the university or some applied research institution and they connect them with the business institution, the, with the industry, in order to begin the process of research engagement. And government becomes involved by funding and supporting that so that the researcher has money uh, to do his or her work with his team or her team. And the industry is assisted by supplemental funds that allows the industry to get its research work done in order to move it higher up the value chain. And I think we need to begin to do some things like that. What we need to do again is establish na national priorities for research, particularly in emerging areas. That we are actively doing. I've established in my ministry a research uh, capacity involving all national scholars in Trinidad and Tobago. And I have four people coordinating that. One is an econometrician, one is an, an economist, the other is a, an international economist. These two are local. They are from here. One is from the University of the West Indies. And we have also included a GIS specialist who focuses on geospatial data and economic uh, development and how these things interlink. And they are the coordinators of about 12 national scholars, all of them with master's degrees in different disciplines. And they are focusing on the areas that we need to begin to research. Now, I'll give you just one quick example. For instance, the issue of aging is a big issue, what they call the silver economy in the world. And that has to do with the baby, with the, um, the baby boomers and the implications of that all over the world but especially in North America, but we have our situation here. And if you look at 2011 census results, you will see how the bulge is in the middle. So we have a dearth of young population. Uh, we have a significant growth of aging population, and most of the bulge is in the middle of the population. So with that, the aging issue is gonna become a big issue. So the silver economy, which is a global economy, is very important to us. And we can have a research capability built here in Trinidad and Tobago that is related to that, that solves some of our problems in Trinidad and Tobago, but also has global implications so that we might be able to contribute to the global solutions to the problem. The same issue is, is, simi this is, the issue is similar in climate change research. And that is why we work with the World Bank to get that climate change research, climate change research going. And the reason we are collaborative in the region is because the problems in Trinidad and Tobago are similar and perhaps the challenges are worse in other countries because all of these countries that are islands are going to be affected by the climate change issues. And in doing that and finding solutions for climate change for our islands and for our scenes and our geographical region, it has implications, let's say, for the Pacific, 
where the ocean is more dominant than the size of the islands. And having found them for the islands, the solutions I mean, we can then extrapolate on that basis through international collaboration to make a contribution to global solutions to climate change issues. So that is how we've got to begin to think about the research now, not in the traditional way of publication of papers. There is nothing wrong with that, and that will continue because it is part of the knowledge generation of the world. But we have to think about the research in terms of applications and solutions. The fourth area that Trinidad and Tobago has to address is the extent to which we have to adjust immigration policies to facilitate an increase in the number of highly skilled persons in Trinidad and Tobago in key areas. Our tertiary education participation rate now is 57%. We are going to achieve our target of 60% next year. Okay? So, but our graduation rate is 38%. And the pace of diversification is slower than the ability of the diversification process and the generation of business to absorb. And I want to say that we are, uh, uh, we are generating businesses. In the last year alone, 2013, we generated 2,200 new businesses in Trinidad and Tobago. And the latest results of the unemployment figures in this country is 3.7% from the CSO, down from just about 5% in the quarter before, and this is based on the 2013 figures. Now, what that tells you really is that something is happening in the economy, and development is taking place, but you, in order to push this development, what is really required are entrepreneurial energy, technical competence, the absorption of technology at a, at a level of sophistication that would help to boost the innovative capacity of the country, but also the ability to generate new ideas, new businesses, new technologies. And I think that that, address, that begins to force us to think about how many people and what level of skill do we need to develop the country at the pace that we require to achieve the per capita income that we desire and to grow the GDP at a rate that we consider reasonable for the development that we have already achieved in this country and the per capita income that we already have. So this is an issue that we need to actively consider. And you would see that some of the migration that we have been encouraging are in areas such as uh, medicine, that's to say doctors, are in areas such as nurses, etc. But some, we, those, those, we are going to have to look to other areas as we begin to talk to people involved in actual industry in the country. The, fourth, the fifth thing that we need to look at is developing key areas such as the life sciences, ICT, the green economy, and climate change. Well, I mentioned a little bit about climate change. We are actively involved in, um, in uh, alternative energy and renewable energy uh, research and applications and attraction of investment. The ICT sector, we've just taken a 20 million US dollar loan. That's to say we've signed on it. We have not spent a dollar yet, but we've signed the dotted line with the um, IDB to develop the ICT export sector in Tr Trinidad and Tobago. And the life sciences are very important because genetic research is an important part of this. And a lot of our diseases here require perhaps some collaboration internationally where we can be, be able to develop that sector. So these are areas where we can begin to do it and of course in plant genetic research as well, where we have developed a tremendous capability. I don't know if you know Professor Rumaharan at the University of the West Indies. He is a Sri Lankan by birth, but he has lived there for all his years. His wife is a Trinidadian, his children are Trinidadian. And he is an important global standards, high quality researcher. 
and he has developed the capability, for instance, of creating anthuriums that are of every color, from the whitest white to the blackest black, and all the colors in between. And he has also been able to create anthuriums on which you can have one color with patterns on the color. So there is a lot of work that is going on here in terms of genetic research, uh, at least on the plant side, and we need to do some of it in the human side. And finally, signaling government support for innovation and a low carbon future through its procurement policy. Well, I have gotten so much licks on procurement, it's not funny. And most of it uncalled for and absolutely misdirected because the delays in procurement really fundamentally has had nothing to do with me, but in fact with other players and stakeholders in the, in the system. But I'm happy to say we are at the point where the legislation after significant consultation is going to be in Parliament. And one of the elements in that procurement is in fact to deal with the business, not just of local content and sustainable procurement and sustainable development, but how to use the procurement process to green the development trajectory as we go forward uh, in procurement. Now, set in the context or frame for innovation. In 2010, government established seven pillars for the sustainable development of Trinidad and Tobago. Pillar five emphasized the development of a knowledge-based economy as government took responsibility for creating the framework to spark the creative capacity of our citizens. In the 2011-2014 medium-term policy framework, Innovation for Lasting Prosperity, government articulated its attention of intention of promoting and achieving the geographic dispersion of opportunities through the five growth poles and through the seven diversification areas. And we identified five priorities for budgetary allocation, which has consistently informed budgetary allocation since 2011. These are health, health and, and, uh, and health-related services, uh, food security and sustainability, crime, law and order, and human security, um, poverty eradication and human development. What, what's the fifth? What am I forgetting? Oh, and job creation, growth, competitiveness, innovation, and diversification. And consistently, the budget has been focused on that. In terms of diversification strategy, we have identified, as I said, seven sectors for diversification. We have done cluster mapping projects, and we have identified potential cl clusters in the growth pools. So in Central Trinidad, we have identified what are the po potential clusters. In Southwest Peninsula, we have identified it. In the North Coast, we have identified it. And we have a sustainable cities project in Port of Spain in which East Port of Spain as a growth pool has been identified, and we've identified the areas there. And I was in Tobago last week, and we are beginning serious discussions with the House of Assembly and the stakeholders in North East Tobago in order to develop those growth pools. And that will be driven by the Economic Development Board. I just met with the Chief Secretary to kind of clear the way for a collaborative relationship so that they can proceed with that. Uh, we are moving to greater evidence-based decision-making. For instance, we have established the National Performance Framework and the annual reports. I laid two days ago in Parliament the annual report for 2013. I did the same thing in early March in 2013 for the 2012 report. And what it means is that Trinidad and Tobago has now established not just a national performance uh, uh, framework, but regular reporting based on 52 indicators and 26 results areas for Trinidad and Tobago based on the five priority. Uh, planning for sustainable communities. What you don't know and what I share with you is that there are about close to 800 communities across Trinidad and Tobago and we have profiled most of those communities as we did the National Spatial Development Framework Strategy and we are updating a lot of those profiles, the ones that we were, were earlier, so that we can link national spatial development strategy 
to regional development strategies, to community-based strategies, and link them all together in alignment so that we can have coherence in development strategy for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, establishment of the five growth poles in specific areas across Trinidad, I wouldn't mention those again because I mentioned them before, but I do want to mention the Sustainable Cities Project in East Port of Spain. What we are trying to do in East Port of Spain is not only involve government in interventions that make a difference in the lives of the people, and I want to say in East Port of Spain between 2011, 12, and 13, we have done over 40 projects that have made a difference to the lives of the people there and are continuing to do projects that will be completed in this year and next year. But where we are now, and we are having a meeting on April 2nd with a whole range of people to do this, is that we are now bringing the private sector into investment mode in East Port of Spain to develop that part of the area. Because you cannot develop any area on the basis of government projects alone. You've got to bring the private sector into the area. And when people see private sector investing in an area that is depressed, it makes a big difference in the way it, perceptions are altered in that part of the country. At the present time, we have a whole team from Columbia University in New York who are here together with two professors. And just as we did with the Swiss students, they are looking at the East Port of Spain area. And more specifically, what they are looking at is at the transportation system in Trinidad and Tobago and how it might link.